undifferentiated experience of the etheric. As a person's etheric body changes through the influence of esoteric development, he or she acquires more of what may be called a, quote, feeling for time, close quote. This sense of time refers to our capacity to plunge with thinking and feeling into the sequence of phenomena and events within time. Ordinarily, we lack a clearly articulated sense for time. I have already briefly noted, however, that the feeling for time arises when, through inner development, the etheric body begins to change, and we become more sensitive, for example, to the seasonal changes of summer and winter. These changes in the etheric body allow us to experience the outer flux of events in a much more lively and sensitive manner. Those who have earnestly tried to develop the soul will perceive a distinct difference among the various seasons and even among the aspects of each season. They gradually begin to sense inwardly a vast difference between summer and winter, between spring, summer and autumn, and also between shorter periods during the year. The moving course of time becomes, so to speak, something living, and we gradually become aware that in the course of time we perceive life as differentiated. Just as, in the physical body, the individual organs are distinct and become inwardly enlivened and independent of one another, so the different periods of the flow of time become more self-contained or independent of one another. This relates to the fact that the development of our own etheric bodies allows us to participate in the outer etheric life that completely surrounds us. We are surrounded not only by air, but by the ether as well, and this ether lives a real life in time. In a sense, the surrounding ether is a kind of living being. It is alive. And just as our lives vary according to the stages of life, the life of the surrounding ether varies according to the flow of time. Thus, we can learn to experience and sense the continuity of life in the external ether, and we can acquire an ever-deepening feeling for what the etheric life is really like as we experience the changes in the flow of time, the change of seasons. When we feel the arrival of spring, the approach of summer, summer at its zenith, and then its waning, approaching autumn and then its arrival, we can learn to participate in this outer process, distinguishing clearly between the life of summer and spring, the life of summer and autumn, and the life of real winter. We will come to sense these differences more and more strongly, until we finally come to feel that the earth with its ether lives an independent life, and inasmuch as we live within time, we are literally immersed in this changing ether. During midsummer, we sense most clearly that in relation to our own etheric body, we are, quote, on our own, so, close quote, so to speak, that during midsummer we participate in a particular aspect of Earth's life when it affects us inwardly very little. When we are on our own, in quotes, we gradually come to understand what the occultists' words, quote, during summer the earth sleeps, close quote. Here we touch on something that is interpreted very incorrectly because of maya, or the illusion that surrounds humanity. In our outer life, directed by maya, we like to compare spring to the morning, summer to midday, and autumn to evening. This is a false comparison, since it is unrelated to reality. In fact, when we want to compare seasonal changes to something in ourselves, we must compare spring, summer, and autumn, in this order, to earth's time of sleeping. And we must compare autumn, winter, and spring to the time when earth is awake. When we speak of the earth spirit, we must imagine that in the hemisphere where summer reigns, the earth spirit is in the same condition, so to speak, as sleeping human beings. There is, of course, a difference between ourselves and the earth. The human being is either asleep or awake, whereas the earth 
for, whereas for earth one hemisphere is awake while the other sleeps. Essentially, the earth spirit never sleeps. When its waking activity is replaced in one hemisphere by sleep, it transfers its waking activity to the other hemisphere. For the moment, however, we can ignore this distinction. Instead, in order to consider human participation in the earth's life, it is necessary to consider only one hemisphere. We must imagine that during summer, the earth spirit separates, in a sense, from its physical body, in other words, from the earth itself, and that during summer the relationship between the earth spirit and its earthly body is the same as that between a human being and the physical body during sleep. While asleep, the physical and etheric bodies lie in the bed where they lead a purely vegetative life. Occult vision observes that during sleep, something in the body unfolds like a delicate vegetative process, like a burgeoning of pure vegetative life, which restores the forces exhausted during waking life. Thus, in a sense, the, in quotes, summertime of human beings occurs during sleep. If, while the astral body and the eye are outside the physical body, we were to look down at our sleeping physical body, one would see the physical body burgeoning, like the plant life on earth during spring and summer. While asleep, we would perceive something in the physical body, like the burgeoning vegetative life of summertime. Since our own hemisphere of earth sleeps during summer, we are on our own with regard to our own etheric body during that period. As a result, when we have acquired the capacity through esoteric development to perceive the human etheric body, we find that such perception is better and clearer in summer than in winter. We perceive the autonomy, as it were, of the etheric body, and in our present epoch, the independence of the head's etheric aspect, the etheric foundation of the brain, is especially perceptible. It is most remarkable when, by participating in earth's etheric life during summer, we gradually acquire an inner sense of this particular part of the human etheric body, that is, the head. During spring, this is felt differently than during summer, and differently again as autumn approaches. The degree of these variations is such that just as we speak of the distinct members of the physical body, we may speak of the different lives we live over the course of summer, lives clearly distinguishable among one another. The life that unfolds within us during spring and the one that unfolds inwardly during summer are different, and that which unfolds in autumn is different again. Similarly, when speaking, we must differentiate between the etheric body as a whole and the aspect of the etheric body associated with the head. If we picture the human being schematically, we can imagine the etheric body, as I have just spoken of it, accompanying the stream of time. Indeed, the upper part becomes less and less perceptible and becomes indefinite, becoming indefinite. Then we gradually begin to feel, very clearly, that beings are working creatively in this part of our etheric body, beings who follow one another in the seasonal changes, so to speak, from spring to autumn. We perceive that the seasons affect the cerebral part of our etheric body and cause our etheric brain, in some respects, to become a complex organ. It has been built up by different spiritual beings whose capacities manifest in successive epochs. Here we gain insight into a very important teaching that was cultivated especially in the schools of Zarathustra, which taught that the etheric body of the human brain was gradually created from out of the cosmos by spiritual beings called Amshaspans. These Amshaspans exercised sovereignty during summer, and indeed hold sway even today, successively replacing one another with the first ruling early spring, the second ruling spring, and so on to the sixth and seventh. Six of these spiritual beings work consecutively in time, They are the creative spirits who, just because they work consecutively, 
with one completing its work before the next takes over, they create an entity as complex as the etheric body, especially our brain's etheric organization, in which six or seven spiritual beings are successively active. Indeed, we will understand the physical human brain only when we understand that within the brain a spirit works who can be felt especially in early spring and who projects primarily etheric forces. Then in late spring comes a second spirit who in turn projects its forces which stream into the same space. The third spirit in turn pours in its etheric forces. Thus the etheric aspect of the human brain is formed by spirit beings who successively replace one another and pour their etheric forces into the same space. We must be clear that only because our brain is related to these spirits who manifest their etheric forces outside of us that we feel certain relationships. However, occult knowledge teaches us that what I have just described occurred during the ancient moon period. We must not assume, therefore, that these same spirits who take command, so to speak, during summer are still active today as formative forces. Human beings have brought into earthly existence the aptitudes that were rayed in by these spirits during the ancient moon period. However, because we contain these capacities within our etheric body, we can still feel a relationship to them today even though these spiritual beings no longer directly influence the inner etheric body of the brain. This is what we feel in summer. In early spring, we feel the first of these spirits, who has another outer task today in the ether. We feel that we owe it what we bear within ourselves, what we received on the ancient moon. Our feeling is that we were related to the spirit at that time, This is one of the most powerful discoveries we can make in the course of esoteric development, the experience through the moving stream of time of something like an imprint or reflection of spiritually active beings who today have a very different task than in the past when they help to create our being. During the period of Earth's formation, the physical brain appeared as an imprint, in quotes, or an impression of what had developed as a result of these spiritual cosmic influences as a kind of etheric archetype during the ancient moon period. I have depicted this part of our etheric body as open above because this is how we feel it. We feel it in this way because as soon as we become aware of it in ourselves we feel that we are opening ourselves to the spiritual worlds, that we stand in the context of spiritual reality which is always there above us. Yet another impression gradually develops in esoteric life in relation to this part of the etheric body. In general, it is not easy to make oneself understood in these matters, but I hope that if I try to explain them clearly, we will understand one another. As we begin to experience our etheric body, we feel as if we are floating in the flow of time. However, in relation to the first part of the etheric body, the etheric aspect of the head, our impression is that we are taking time with us, as it were. We do not feel that we are merely floating forward in the stream of time, but that we are taking the stream of time along with us. Actually, we carry much that belongs to an earlier age in the etheric part of the head. As I said, we carry the ancient moon period there since the most essential part of the head developed at that time. Thus in the brain's etheric body we carry with us the stream of the ancient moon period. As we come to experience this, it is like a memory of the time on the ancient moon. When we form an idea of the inner experiences associated with the different temperaments described in the last lecture, we can also understand why it is said that occultists concentrating particularly on the etheric aspect of the head come to associate the experience of the inner nature of the etheric body in the head with the melancholy that grips an individual during self-absorption. During esoteric development, 
It feels as if a mood of melancholy were being poured into one's head, and out of this mood gradually dawns an understanding of the things described occultly in the, as the ancient moon. Esoteric development, of course, must go much farther if one really wants to describe the various conditions of the ancient moon. What we have just discussed is only the beginning of such a description. What could be called, quote, melancholy of the head, close quote, arises within human beings, and within that frame of mind, a vision or memory vision, reaching into a far distant past, indeed, indeed into a gradually emerging ancient moon period. It would be worthwhile for you to ascertain, on the basis of the descriptions I just gave, how esoteric development proceeds. You would discover how beginning with a particular experience, one first learns to recognize such an experience, for example a memory from the remote past that we have carried with us on the stream of time into the present, and how one then learns to unroll, in quotes, again what one lived through long ago. You will realize from this that occultists do not indulge in idle fancies in their descriptions of the cosmic structure dating back to the ancient moon, sun, and Saturn epochs. In other words, if we wait patiently and listen to how these things were arrived at, we get an idea of how it is possible to live gradually into those grand and powerful cosmic pictures, which certainly belong to a far distant past, but which can be invoked again from the present life. We must, however, reach the stage of development where we can inwardly experience past events that lie concealed within us and thus bring them into the light of day. The second part of the etheric body, belonging to the middle portion of the human being, is experienced differently. Outwardly, feeling is lost. Inwardly, it is perceived in such a way that one might say, what is portrayed here, and there's a diagram in the next page, What is portrayed here in the middle as a kind of oval form is felt to be detached from the rest. When we consider the experience of this middle portion as separate from the rest of the etheric body, we must recognize that once we manage to experience in ourselves through esoteric development the differentiated life of this middle portion of the human being, we get the feeling that it is precisely in this part of the etheric body that we swim along with the stream of t- with the time stream in this part of the etheric body we still clearly experience our participation in the etheric life of the earth which has a distinct and separate character according to the various seasons as we progress esoterically we feel within the middle portion of the etheric body that during early spring Spirits, other than those of midsummer or autumn, work on us. It is a kind of participation in, or more precisely, a kind of floating with the stream of time. This aspect of the etheric body is thus dissociated from the rest. And if we explore these matters more closely, the feeling we have in this middle region of the etheric body alternates between the phlegmatic and sanguine moods. This feeling assumes a wide variety of nuances between those two moods. In spring, for example, one feels as though the etheric body is floating with the stream of time. This is expressed differently in the physical body. And toward autumn, a resistance to the stream of time, a withdrawal into oneself is experienced. A third part of the etheric body, the lower part, is felt to lose itself in the indefinite, to vanish into the earth, while at the same time it becomes more widely diffused. Such are the three parts of the etheric body which can be experienced separately. What I've just described is the inner feeling or experience of the etheric body. To the clairvoyant, for example, this inner experience would be different while observing the etheric body of another person because what I have described arises from an inner experience of one's own etheric body. This experience is considerably modified by the existence of a fourth member of the etheric body. 
This is clearly shaped as an oval form embracing the entire human being. From the different feelings experienced in relation to these parts of the etheric body, we gradually get the feeling of an inner impression of the etheric body as though it arises from an outward form. Furthermore, the etheric body assumes different hues. The upper part appears to be enveloped in a kind of bluish or blue-violet aura, depending on the nature of the person. This part, corresponding to the head, gradually becomes a greenish color below the head, whereas the middle portion is a distinct yellowish-red, assuming one sees the color, and the lower part is a distinctly reddish to deep red color that rays out and frequently covers a wide area. The forces that work in these four parts are differentiated in such a way that our inner feelings are not very distinct. When we look from without at the outermost aura clairvoyantly, however, the forces active in this aura compress the upper part and give the impression that the etheric aspect of the head is the same shape as the head itself, but a little larger. And the same is true of the middle portion. The further down one goes, however, the less this applies. But because these forces work on one another when seen from without, one gets the impression that the etheric body is a kind of prototype of the physical body, though projecting a little beyond it. Toward the lowest part, the feeling of the correspondence between the physical body and etheric body is gradually lost. You must remember, however, that the inner experience of the etheric body is not the same as what is revealed to outer clairvoyant observation. This must be clearly understood. When, through esoteric development, we learn to notice the fundamental temperaments latent in the etheric body, as described yesterday, you will find that in relation to the lower part of the etheric body the prevailing mood is choleric. Thus the various members of our etheric body are differentiated according to the various temperaments. The upper part is inclined toward the melancholic temperament. The middle alternates between phlegmatic and sanguine, and the lower aspect is inclined toward the choleric. I ask you to note particularly that this description applies to the etheric body. When we fail to carefully consider these things, if we take these matters only superficially, we may easily fall into error. But when we consider this fully, we are struck by the consistency between what has been advanced here and certain of life's phenomena. Let's look at a choleric person for a moment, since this provides a most interesting example. According to what was just said, in the choleric person, the lower part of the etheric body would be especially well developed and would predominate over the other parts. Such an individual would be a choleric type. The other parts are also developed, of course, but the lower part would be particularly predominant. When the lower part of the etheric body is especially developed as etheric body, and when it is endowed with powerful forces, something else always occurs, that is, the physical body pays the penalty and may show certain shortcomings in the parts underlying this part of the etheric body. Thus it would follow that in true cholerics the anatomical condition of certain organs corresponding to this part of the etheric body would show insufficient development. Read the anatomical findings on Napoleon, for example, and you will be struck by the way it proves what I am saying. Footnote. Napoleon Bonaparte 1769 to 1821, French ruler from 1804 to 1814 and 1815. Dr. Steiner said of him, quote, Napoleon, another classic example of the cleric, was so short because his ego had held the other members back. Of course, one cannot generalize that all clerics are short and all sanguines tall. It is a question of proportion. What matters is the relation of size to overall form, close quote, uh, in the four temperaments. Uh, also in a book which is on this website entitled uh, Anthroposophy in Everyday Life. End of footnote. Only when we begin to study the hidden aspects of human nature can we really come to understand these matters. You may now ask, quote, how does the previous lecture agree with what we have said here today? Close quote. It agrees perfectly. 
We spoke yesterday of the four temperaments which are determined by the forces of the etheric body. Indeed, the life of the etheric body is related to time in the same way that the differentiated structural members are related to space. The physical body becomes more vitally alive inwardly in the element of space, differentiating its various members, as it were. The etheric body becomes more alive as its members are differentiated in the element of time, that is, when life within time is experienced successively in the independent parts and members. Melancholics have the essential characteristic of always carrying with them something they have experienced in time, an experience from the past. When we come to understand the melancholic's etheric body, we find that it still bears within it the echoes of what was experienced in the past. I am not referring now to the human brain, which relates to primeval times, as we mentioned before, but to what is generally called melancholy. Let's say, for example, that the etheric life of the head is stimulated at some time during youth. What has been stimulated is so strongly implanted that, later in life, this melancholic still carries in the etheric body the pulsations imprinted during youth. In one who is not a melancholic, however, such reverberations have ceased. In the case of those with phlegmatic and sanguine temperaments, on the other hand, there is a kind of floating with the stream of time. But in the phlegmatic person there is a perfectly steady floating with the stream of time, whereas the sanguine person alternates between a quicker pace of inner experience and a slower reaction to the outer flow of time. Cholerics, characteristically, resist the approaching future, and thus they reject time in a certain sense, and quickly try to rid themselves of the reverberations that time evokes in the etheric body. Melancholics, therefore, carry within them the most echoes of past experiences, while cholerics have the least. If you recall the somewhat coarse comparison between the fully inflated ball and the choleric's etheric body, you can use that analogy again here. It is difficult for successive events to make an impression on the ball. The etheric body of the choleric rejects them and thus will not permit the events at work in the stream of time to reverberate strongly within it. Hence cholerics do not carry past events for very long within themselves. Melancholics who allow events to work deeply into their etheric body must suffer for a long time the echoes carried within them from the past into the future. To acquire an understanding of the etheric and physical bodies, it is good to recall that the physical body is essentially a body in space and the etheric body a temporal being. If we regard the etheric body as being solely within space, we will not understand it. The diagram we made is only a spatial representation of the etheric body's life flowing in the stream of time and adjusted to the time current. Because the life of the etheric body itself runs its course within time, we also experience time through the etheric body, that is, we experience the external stream of events in time. When we develop esoterically, we also experience another stream of events in time, which is the day's rhythm. In ordinary life, we are barely aware of this as a rhythmic sequence or course of events, but we certainly become more aware of it when the soul becomes more highly developed. The spirits of the year's changing seasons also work within the passage of the day, although they then work less forcefully. After all, the same sun determines both the course of the day and the course of the year. Once we have developed esoterically, we soon discover a relationship between the etheric body and the events in the outer ether. We discover that our relationship to the spirits of morning is different from our relationship to the spirits of midday, and again different from the spirits of evening. The spirits of morning affect us in such a way that our etheric body feels more stimulated by activity inclined more toward the intellect, toward reason, toward reflection on one's experience 
toward judgment of what we remember. As midday approaches, the powers of judgment gradually diminish, and we feel inwardly the will's impulses coming more into play. Even as we notice that toward midday our work forces, in quotes, are becoming less productive than in the morning, inwardly the will forces are becoming more active. Then the time toward evening manifests productive forces related more to imagination. Thus the various spiritual beings who send their forces into the earth's etheric life conditions also differentiate their respective duties. We can rest assured that the more we overcome today's materialistic mode of thinking, the more we come to understand the necessity of considering the etheric body's adjustment to the time element. The time will come when we will consider it strange whenever the morning session in schools is devoted to subjects that demand imagination. In the future we will find this just as odd as we do when seeing someone wearing a fur coat in August or light summer wear in winter. These things, it is true, seem a distant reality today, but they will come far sooner than people expect. A time will come when, just as we recognize the difference between summer and winter, people will realize the absurdity of arranging the curriculum in any way other than to devote several hours in the morning to study, then make the afternoon free, and again in the evening devote several hours to study. The typical school schedule currently uses, excuse me, the typical school schedule currently used makes this seem impractical but one day it will be found to be in harmony with the requirements of human nature. The morning will then be devoted to mathematics and the evening to poetry reading. We now live in a time when such understanding is buried completely under an avalanche of materialism now at its height. Eventually, when we consider the nature of the whole human being, we will recognize that what seems most reasonable today will be seen to be most foolish. Another effect that will arise more and more as a result of esoteric development will be our decreased feeling of being closed off within the etheric body more during winter than in summer. We will more and more feel that during winter we are more directly united with the earth spirit. This difference will be such that during summer we will feel as though we are living with the spirits who have worked on us since primordial times the spirits whose work we carry within us. The earth spirit, however, will draw away from us during summer. During winter, the echoes carried within us since ancient times, especially in the head, will be less manifest, and we will feel more united with the earth spirit, realizing that it keeps a vigil in winter. As the earth spirit sleeps in summer, so it keeps watch in winter. In summer, the earth spirit sees the burgeoning of the plants, just as sleeping human beings see the vegetative forces awaken in their own bodies. During winter, the growth forces withdraw, just as they withdraw during the waking life of the human being. In winter, the earth spirit keeps watch, and earth is united, as it were, with the waking spirit just as human beings are united during waking hours with the awakened spirit. As a result of esoteric development, we begin to feel that during summer, when thinking, we must work hard to elaborate our thoughts, but not our inspirations which spring from within, from the independent etheric body. In winter, thoughts inspire us more easily than in summer, so that in winter, human thought works more as an inspiration than in summer. This uniquely human thinking comes to us so easily in winter that in a certain sense it becomes spontaneous. Of course, these two modes of thinking may be combined in diverse ways. They may assume a very individual form in a particular person, so that when one is more inclined to think thoughts tending toward the supersensible, this may be reversed. Just because it is easier in summer than in winter to direct one's thoughts toward the supersensible, it is also possible that just the reverse may happen. But what I have just said is true concerning the experience of the etheric body. 
As we progress in esoteric development, we become more sensitive to our experience and participation in the life of external etheric forces. And if we want to develop the etheric body in the right way, we must first suppress sensory perception. Then we must gradually develop the capacity to consciously set aside thinking as well. Specifically, we must gradually replace abstract thinking with concrete pictorial thinking. Then we must proceed from thinking to concepts, and finally we must suspend concept altogether. Then, once we have completely cleared our consciousness and suspended our concepts, as described in the second part of my outline of esoteric science, we feel that our ordinary thinking ceases, and what we had previously produced by our own efforts as thinking dissolves. In its place we experience a remarkable enlivening through thoughts suddenly available and streaming into us as though from unknown realms. This transition in the life of the human soul may be characterized by saying that, and please do not misunderstand the expression, the human being stops being smart and begins to grow wise. A very definite idea is related to this. The intellect that we cultivate inwardly through judgment and acumen, which is an earthly inheritance, disappears. We develop an inner frame of mind that places little value on qualities since we gradually begin to experience within ourselves a wisdom enkindled by the gods. Please do not misunderstand these terms, for such an experience enables us to use this expression without arrogance, but in all humility and modesty. In the face of wisdom bestowed by the gods, we become more humbled. We are defiantly proud only of our own cleverness and our so-called intellect. As we experience this, we gradually feel as though wisdom, this heaven-sent wisdom, is streaming into the etheric body and filling it. This is a very important experience because we experience this in a remarkable way. We feel that life is carried along within the time stream, but the stream of wisdom is coming toward us, and as we float with the stream of time, it pours into us as an advancing stream. Indeed, we feel this inflowing, figuratively speaking, as streams, but streams existing in time that enter through the head, that pour into the body and are absorbed by it. What I have just described gradually becomes a very particular experience. We no longer experience ourselves in space, but learn to feel the etheric body, which is a time body. We learn to move within the element of time, while at the same time we learn continually to meet the spiritual beings who approach us from the other side of the cosmos, as it were, and who come toward us from the future to grant us with wisdom. The experience of receiving such wisdom can be attained only when we have progressed esoterically or occultly, in such a way that we have developed a feeling that prepares the soul to meet all future contingencies such as when we have developed serenity toward all that the future may bring us, or whatever future experiences life may have awaiting us. As long as we face these experiences with strong feelings of sympathy and antipathy, if we have not yet learned to take our karma seriously, that is, with equanimity, no matter what karma brings, then we cannot yet have that unique understanding of the wisdom that streams toward us. Only through experience accepted with serenity can we distinguish the luminous currents of wisdom that penetrate our being. The experience I just described indicates a definite stage in our esoteric experience, the stage where we arrive and where we arrive and can really experience only when we accept every trial that comes our way with gratitude and serenity. Sorry, let me read that again. The experience I just described indicates a definite stage in our esoteric experience, the stage where we arrive and can really experience only when we accept every trial that comes our way with gratitude and serenity. The transformation of our etheric body that takes place 
in true esoteric development enables us to do this because in addition to other requirements of esoteric development it demands that we acquire serenity and a true understanding in relation to our karma. Thus we will not, because of sympathy and antipathy, attract what karma has in store for us, nor rebel against the blows of fate, but instead we will learn to accept our karma with equanimity. This acceptance of karma forms part of our esoteric development and makes it possible for us to transform our etheric body so that it gradually becomes more and more aware of the outer etheric life surrounding it.